Welcome to Marketing Monday. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Brittany Sweeney. I'm with the Livestock Conservancy. And here with me today, I have my brand new assistant, Emily Rose Mitchell. <laughs> She's part of our new communications team. Yay! Um, we also have two thirds of the amazing NC Choices team here today. <laughs> We're so excited that they're here joining us. Uh, Sarah, Matt, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do and, and um, what NC Choices is all about? Sure. I'm happy to start. So I'm Sarah Blackland. I'm the program director for NC Choices. And NC Choices is a program based out of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, which is housed at NC State and also North Carolina Cooperative Extension. So I'm down here in North Carolina. Matt's up there in Ithaca, New York. Matt's part of our team, as well as my colleague Lee, who's not here today, but our goal at NC Choice is, is basically to help grow and advance pasture-raised meat state. So we work with farmers that raise animals out on pasture, uh, but we also work with any of the businesses they depend upon to get that meat to the end consumer. So that's the processor and the customers and the distributors, and we work in that kind of squishy middle section of the pricing and um, everything in between. And that's um, that's how we got to know and work with Matt. So I'll hand it off to you. All right, thanks. And I'm, I'm Matt LaRue. I, I work for Cornell University as an extension associate. I work mostly with uh, small farms or, or farms that are direct to consumer marketing. Um, and I work on uh, marketing topics, marketing research, pricing, and created the meat price calculator. And then in my role with NC Choices, I'm What's my title, Sarah, with my NC Choices title? <laughs> specialist, isn't that Marketing specialist with <laughs> NC Choices. That's fantastic. Well, thank you both for being here. We're so excited to chat with you about um, meat pricing and how um, small farmers can better set prices for their product. And we want them to make more money for their product because raising heritage breeds is challenging enough. <laughs> Um, so if y'all have questions and you're watching it, type them in as a comment and we'd be more than happy to get to them. Um, but to start out, uh, y'all are launching the new meat calculator. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, the, the meat price calculator, the new version is live now. Uh, it's free for anyone to use. If your farm's in New York, Massachusetts, or North Carolina, you can create an account. But if you're outside those states, you can still use the tool for free. Um, so the meat price calculator works on, um, well, it's, it's really designed to help you set prices for individual cuts of meat, or if you're selling quarters, halves and holes to set prices for carcasses. And, and it's just supposed to be, um, kind of want to say an, an approachable means to begin the pricing process and, you know, figure in your costs, your financial goals, and then, um, you know, kind of get through that challenge of looking at consumer demand for various cuts of meat compared to their yields and hopefully use price as a tool to sort of sync up the uh, the rate of speed with the carcass yield. And everyone can find that calculator on your website. That's meat suite, S uh, S U I T E, like a hotel suite.com slash calculator. Um, and that's through your Meat Sweet uh, website. Sarah, do you want to say a few words about Meat Sweet? Yeah, yeah. So we just launched a new version of Meat Sweet. So Meat Sweet is basically an online directory. It's a way for customers who are wanting to find local meat near them to connect with farms near them. And the whole um, specialty of Meat Sweet is that it just focuses on meat in bulk quantities. So when we say bulk, whole halves quarter animals, but also bulk boxes. So even if you're looking for 20 pounds of sausage or something as small as that, that's considered a bulk item. And a lot of the time customers just don't know where to find the farms. And those farms might not be at farmer's markets or places like that. So um, we try to make it easy. And so you can search by the products you want or um, prices or location and how close they are, or just various label claims like heritage and other kinds of animal types that you're looking for um and it's all free because we are a program through the university so Yay. that's it so meat sweet is operating in new york and north carolina um the meat sweet farm directory so only farms in those states can be listed but then the meat price calculator 
is available to everyone on the same site. Great. That's awesome. What a great resource. Um, so what are some kind of pricing guidelines that you generally tell people when they're looking to get started? Um, I kind of think about it in, in four pieces. Um, it, it's funny, you know, when, when we're getting involved in something that we're passionate about, uh, any small business this could apply to, but of course it applies to farmers. Sometimes we might, um, our decision making might stray off from our intent. So the, the first thing I like for people to realize is that they need to set a farm income goal. Just how much yeah. money are we hoping to gross from the farm? And then think about dividing that total across enterprises. So let's say you raise beef and pork and you have you know a hundred thousand dollar income goal. How are we going to divide the hundred thousand dollar goal across beef and pork? based on numbers, right? And that can actually get you down to a per head goal, which you know it makes the pricing process easier. So step one would be to set farm income goals. Step two would be to collect the best data that you can. Um, so we're talking about cost of production. You know, start start somewhere. Start in year one with collecting the prices that you, you know, you, your feed costs or your time, a log of your time. Just start where you can on estimating cost of production. Uh, when you bring an animal back from the processor, weighing out all the meat so you can create carcass yield uh, spreadsheets or, or notebooks, you know, so now you've got more data. Um, keeping track of the amount of time and money that you spend on marketing. If you're doing farmers markets, you know, thinking about how much time that takes. Uh, other, other marketing expenses like paid ads. Um, observing maybe other prices in the market, just not that you're going to use those prices, but to get a sense of what's going on out there. So the, that's the second one was, was collect data. Um, the third one is to go ahead and set your prices and set those prices on individual cuts based on the consumer demand for those cuts, as well as the carcass yield. So it just kind of happens. I'm, I'm most familiar talking with beef, but you know, everybody wants ribeye steaks, but the ribs only 9% of the carcass. So high consumer demand, low yield. Um, that formula should equal a very high price, right? <laughs> um, high demand should, you know, you, if you're selling out of a cut very quickly, um, then you need to raise the price on that cut. If you've got cuts that you tend to sort of sit on, you know, you want to think about maybe the opportunity to lower those prices to help them move faster. Uh, or just maybe changing up the cut sheet and not bringing those cuts back at all. Um, so the third step there was to set prices. And then uh, the final thing I want to say about setting prices is to support your prices with marketing effort. You know, sometimes I get the comment that, you know, oh, you know, I, I figured out what my pricing needs to be, but I could never get those at my farmer's market. Well, yeah, you know, some of some of pricing is, uh, you know, understanding your consumer, understanding your market, looking for the right channels. You really want to look for the consumers that do value what you produce and find out where they shop and how to reach them. Uh, it may not be your hometown farmer's market. It may involve a little travel or, or you know, advertising online, but, but really supporting your prices with marketing effort. That's a great point. Yeah. Do you have any kind of thoughts or ideas for people to help try to find those uh, markets that they're looking for? I don't know. Yeah, it's called market research, and, and market <laughs> research, market research can be as complicated as you want it to be, but it doesn't have to be really complicated. It's, it's thinking about, you know, let's let's take heritage breeds because they're a great example. You know, who is the consumer who, who is, um, looking for or values heritage breed products? I'm trying to understand what are their shopping habits? Where, you know, what stores do they go to? What what can we understand about them sort of culturally? Where would we find them? This is going to lead you to um, where, you know, which markets to be in. Maybe there's a particular, you know, I'm, I, I guess with heritage breeds, I'd start thinking about, you know, college towns. Um, you know, is there a market in this college town? Uh, are there publications that they read? You know, just think Facebook groups that they joined, mm -hmm. reaching that consumer. The, Market research leads you to having your product in 
what we'd call a, a pull market position, which is to say that there are consumers who are demanding the product. So they're in essence, they're pulling the product into the marketplace. And what you um, what you'll find is difficult with your pricing is when you're in a push situation. So pushing is trying to push your product out into the market, which means that you're trying to convince the consumers that you're talking to of the value of your product. And that's that's you just don't want to be there. So you, you need to do some you know, looking around and listening, which we can call market research, uh, to find out where are the shoppers who value what I have and to mm -hmm. get to them. It's customer creeping. It's fine. <laughs> customer creeping. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean, just listen. Around. You know, it's it's funny. I I'm, I talk about marketing topics all the time, and one of my, one farmer that I was presenting for had the question, and she said, um, "Are we allowed to ask our customers questions?" <laughs> I said, oh, yes. yes, absolutely. So if you've got sort of, if you think you've got the sort of quintessential customer coming to you, ask them, how do you use this product? How often do you eat it? You know, mm -hmm. what do you tell your friends about it? Pick their brains. They they want you to, to succeed. So they're going to help you mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. If you've got that relationship with your customers, that two-way street is invaluable. Um because they want you to succeed and keep coming to the market. They want to keep buying your products. Um, so yes, please ask lots of questions of your customers. You're allowed to. <laughs> and I'm not sure if you you guys have a pulse on this yet since this is fairly new, but um, I read that and, and we've all heard stories about specialty products, the demand going down, especially with gas prices and just um, rising inflation. You have any ideas yet? This is you know still emerging, but on how to still market these heritage specialty products um, in kind of a shrinking market or economy. I have some ideas, but I'm wait, waiting to check in with Sarah. No, you go ahead. I mean, All right, well, yeah. I think um, what what I was going to jump to, and it's something that. I'm a real big fan of is, is selling in bulk. So mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to offer uh, more advantageous price per pound when you sell something like quarters, halves and holes. And the reason for that is that um, the farm can put a lot less marketing effort into sales of quarters and halves than, than individual cuts. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's more efficient for the farm. And, and I think it's also, you know, the, the other reason I really like, and that's why we started meat suite was to promote more, bulk sales. Uh, it's efficient for the producer. It can really fit well. It, it gets through some hurdles. I and mean, we talked about the demand of individual cuts. Well, you know, the farmer doesn't have to face that inventory challenge when they do uh, bulk sales. Um, they don't have to have a year round supply when they do bulk sales, right? They can actually market all the animals in a two or three month window, something like that. Uh, and then for the consumer, there's some savings there so they can still eat you know, a differentiated local product. Um, when you buy uh, by the you know the quarter or the half whole. Uh, there's a great sort of um, leveling of the price, and and uh, the farm still does well. So that's what jumps to my mind. We were on the same page, Matt. I was thinking the same thing. Um, I have not. I don't know if you have, Matt, observed a change in. Have you been hearing from the farms that there's been a change? I, I have not down here in North Carolina. I'm still hearing that the demand is really high. And from, at least from our processing standpoint, um, our processors are still booked up um, and still can't keep up with the demand of farmers that want to get their animals processed mm -hmm. and meat for direct sale. So um, I tend to go back to Matt's earlier words on finding, finding your specific customer um and so far i have not seen it but like you said emily it, it's all really new um i think throughout the pandemic we're we're sort of trying to assess as we're also running at the same time and it's just difficult to know with a changing climate where things are actually going to settle we thought that that there would be a lot that that this kind of huge craze of locally sourced products was really going to dip and it, it hasn't so far, at least from our standpoint, from what we've seen in North Carolina for local meats. That's great. Yeah, great yeah. point. All right. Looks like we have a question. Hi, Christine. Thanks for joining us today. We're glad you're here. 
Christine says, I've seen buyer producer meetups sometimes found through extension office. Have y'all seen or used those at all? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, we, we are both with extension. And so while we aren't at the county offices, um, we do work really closely with the county offices. And we also usually have specific projects through grants and other things. And so we actually have had some grower buyer meetups that that we have hosted through grants and also collaborated with some of our county agents to do kind of a, what I know locally, there's a lot of these breakfast meetups, just first thing in the morning, um, small, and it's nice because it's, you know, maybe eight to 10 producers and some buyers. So it's, it's intimate and it can be really informal and that's been really nice. Um, so yeah, I don't know, how does that work up in New York, Matt? Well, it just making me think for, for the promotion of meat sweet around the state, we've funded um, different county offices to hold um, what we usually end up calling meet the farmer. And of course we spell it M-E-A-T, meet the farmer. So that's, you know, uh, producers primarily that are selling in bulk. You know, they're, 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 they all get together and sort of have a table and then consumers are invited to come in, meet, ask questions. Because again, as Sarah said earlier, uh, sometimes the farms that are selling quarters and halves are not as visible um, as, of course, a farmer's market vendors. So they're, they're you know, they're harder to find. And uh, again, I'll go way back to 2010. Uh, one of the reasons we started Meat Suite at that time was because we surveyed consumers about their uh, meat buying habits. And they said, oh, I would buy in bulk, but I don't know any farms that are doing it. So we mm -hmm. thought, all right, well, we'll find the farms for you. And then you then you have no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're, we're, they're, we're seeing meet the farmer events uh, popping up around New York as well. That's awesome. Thank you for that suggestion, Christine. And if anybody else has questions, feel free to write them in. Um, we've got these two awesome experts here to answer your questions about pricing. Um, I love that you connected uh, consumers and buyers and producers with Meat Suite. That's awesome. Because a lot of time they just don't know what they don't know. <laughs> But that's exactly right. They don't know what they don't know. And and those particular producers want help finding the consumers as well. Mm -hmm. So we're serving both sides. And just like any any field that you get into over a period of time, you become more specialized in, you acquire your own language for it, which is not always the common layperson language or the consumer language. So we're all used to, uh, in fact, we need to check one another sometimes when Matt and my colleague Lee and I chat on how we're writing things and if it's digestible for the consumer. So a lot of our farmers might say, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm going to sell you this carcass, but it doesn't include the processing fee and it doesn't include the hanging weight per pound mm -hmm. on this and this and this. And, you know, and that's just going to make a customer's eyes glaze over. Um, that's just not how they're used to selling meat. So some of our job there that we see is to try and kind of demystify the process and make it much more digestible. So for the farmers that are interested in chatting with customers and feel comfortable um, already just getting in front of a customer and talking to them, this is how the process works. This is why it's a little different. This is the amount you can save. This is how much freezer space you need. You know, then it becomes a much more approachable topic. But there's some farmers that just aren't maybe as comfortable with that or they're not quite read ready for that. But they don't even want to talk to customers as much. They just want someone to call and place an order. And so that's kind of why some of those services like Meat Sweet try and fill that gap. Oh, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah, I know a lot of farmers that don't want to talk to anybody. They're like, we just want to deal with the animals and the customers, not so much. <laughs> they say they only want bacon and I don't have any more. <laughs> so. Well, you need to raise your bacon price. <laughs> right. and you know, if I if I may, I I, I want to mention that um, you know a lot of people get nervous about raising prices. A lot of farms, yeah. and we all think about food affordability and our own perspective on buying you know, food and, and our decision making on buying food. And then you know it can it can feel funny to then set prices that that we need to set to for the farm to be viable. But um, Sarah and I have been working on uh, an article that we're going to release uh, very very soon called pricing pep talk and um, it has price observations from grocery stores and farmers markets in North Carolina but it also kind of talks through a few points it's a pep talk people around raising prices 
And uh, I just thought I'd touch on a, a few of those. Yeah, absolutely. One is that if you increase um, your prices on, on some cuts, it doesn't mean that you're going to lose your customer necessarily. So, you know, first off, we can just think that the, the consumer who's maybe coming to a farmer's market or a local farm or a heritage breed farm is not primarily motivated by price. That's, that's not what's driving them to seek out these sources. So they're not primarily price motivated. Next, we could think that, you know, if we raise prices on cuts that are in demand, like, like bacon and ribeye steaks, those are the two I like to pick on. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have anything for that customer. So I just like to think, you know, imagine a scenario where the, the customer comes to the farmer's market planning on having ribeye steaks that for dinner that night. And then they see your new price and they say, oh, oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize how expensive this was going to be. Well, we have all, all these other cuts. In fact, that's why that's that's the whole pricing scenario. So, you know, do we have these other cuts that if this goes great on the grill and it's several dollars a pound less expensive. So you're again, you're using price to assist with inventory management. You still have something for your customer and I don't know, my expression for that is moving them down carcass. You know, they have their their goals set high and we're going to move them down carcass where we need them to buy because, you know, the the chuck is 26% of the carcass and the round is 25% and so on. Um, and then another point is that uh, higher prices, if they did result in selling fewer units, let's say you typically sell 40 pounds of ground beef a month, and you raise your pipe price if if you have a few customers that decide not to not to buy at the new price um it doesn't mean that you're actually going to gross less per month uh, so you know you, you could do some math and sort of scratch that out but um yeah so just some ideas around raising prices and, and not being too worried about it absolutely that's a great point and now's an okay time to raise prices um you know, raising heritage breeds and selling them should be, you know, profitable or at least break even for you. <laughs> At the bare minimum, you should you should be paying yourself for your time as well, and not just counting how much work and effort that you're putting into into all of this farming, because it is a lot of work. And um, it's okay. I love that you brought that up because that is such an important point. To it's okay to raise prices. People are really scared of that. A lot of people are not, a lot of our farmers don't go into grocery stores. I mean, they don't because they eat their own meat. So mm -hmm. they're going into grocery stores to look at the prices of meat, which is something I am sure Matt would encourage them to do. <laughs> uh, they don't realize how expensive meat is in the grocery store. And Absolutely. they just have, sometimes we carry our own assumption that local meat is that much more expensive. We we did a study in 20. 20 now um, where we compared an average of the prices on meat sweets and we could aggregate those compared to some mainstream grocery stores. Mm -hmm. We know that in bulk it's cheaper than by the cut, but what we had found was that a lot of the prices were actually comparable to what we were seeing in mainstream grocery stores. So mainstream grocery stores have no problems raising the prices. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that just is enough to get farmers to be like, Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna see what they sell it down the street for, and it's not these are not apples, apples to apples either. Much much differentiated products depending on what you're raising, so it's worth checking out. Absolutely, that's such an important point, and I love Matt that you're talking about moving them down the circus and and helping people understand, you know, what these cuts are that they might not see at the grocery store that you know that they're really gonna love when they throw it on the grill. And just kind of educating them through that whole point and providing recipes and providing your own story. And like, if you're pretty transparent about everything, you know, people will pay more for your product. Well, and do you guys have any suggestions about um, kind of the marketing of um, the, the, the itself? So, um, you know, Brittany mentioned recipes, but is that something that you ever um work with you know your producers in terms of supplying recipes or is that something that you've seen um at displays that you've passed or you want to go for it matter you want go ahead 
<laughs> I'll say with NC Choices, we are starting to do more with our consumer audience because of Meet Sweet. Mm -hmm. Typically, we've been so in, in the middle of the supply chain that we haven't done quite as much work on the consumer end. Um, but yes, we will, especially thinking of meat as a, as your customer, customer might think of meat. So if, if it's seasonally, if it's for a vacation, if it's for a family of five, if it's that they're trying to feed on a budget, there's so many different ways that people come and associate themselves with purchasing meat. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that goes back to like the marketing research thing that Matt was talking about. Matt, yeah, Matt was talking about at the very beginning. But um, uh, so really it goes back to understanding your customer. I don't want to, you know, mm -hmm. and figuring out what is it that they want in that in that moment for that year for their family, whatever it might be that motivates them um, and then giving them what they want. So mm -hmm. we're, we're encouraging, even if it's in bulk, because bulk is for, for this meat sweet piece um, that we're promoting. Even if it's in bulk, they can even make bulk accessible for people who don't think they're bulk buyers or for people mm -hmm. who don't have the freezer space. Mm -hmm. It might actually be a bulk shopper because maybe they just want a couple pounds of, of sausage for grilling for their family vacation and they don't want to spend three to four hours waiting in a really long line of the mainstream grocery at the beach when they could be on the beach with their kids and their family and they could bring that with them. You know, all the ways to kind of get yourself and put yourself in their shoes Mm -hmm. is, is how at the end of the day you would market a, another strategy to better market the cuts. But Matt, you can go into a lot more than I can. No, no, I, I think what you just said is great. And actually, I think you just gave everybody a handy tip because I just failed when I went on vacation to North Carolina. I did not pack meat from home, but I <laughs> needed ice packs to put in my cooler. So how, how dumb was that? If you're going to the beach, put your frozen meat from your quarter that you bought into your cooler for the drive. It'll keep everything else cold. And then when you when you get to your destination, you've got your meat with you. Good job, Sarah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Why are you using a freezer pack that you can't eat? Just a couple of pounds of frozen ground beef. There you go. That's right. Then burgers will be ready for you when you get there. <laughs> it's perfect. That's a great point. So is, are there other um, resources or, or things that people should be thinking about when they are setting their prices that we haven't covered today? Matt, I know I you made a list of topics that you wanted to. I, yeah, I covered them. I wanted to ask Sarah, Sarah, when the, when the North Carolina pricing pep talk comes out, where will it be found? Oh, good question, Matt. It will be found on the North Carolina Cooperative Extension publication site. So basically, if you go to ncsu.edu, which is our university, and then you type in pep talk or meet pep talk, it'll come up. But along with it will be a library of many other extension publications um, from NC Choices or others um, related to meet. And then you can go down many rabbit holes from there, um, depending on how much agricultural publication you want. <laughs> but we'll hold it there, but we'll also put it on our website, which is ncchoices.com. Um, so it'll also be held there. Thanks, Matt. Yes. And that should be out in August, but, you know, supply chains, everything is taking so much longer <laughs> within the university. Everything's backed up. So, yes. Go to their website. Check that out. Whoops. Helps if I put it back up in choices.com. <laughs> I'm very excited about that paper. That sounds awesome. It must have taken a long time to put all that together. Well, running around to the grocery stores took some time. <laughs> that definitely took some time. I was surprised by how little differentiated meats we had in the grocery stores. Um, we went to, I don't know how many, nine different ones. Oh, wow. And, um, it was very difficult to find a number of cuts under really almost any kind of alternative label claim brand. You could get get a couple, and but limited across species and across labels label claims. So get a lot more if you're buying direct from farmers. Absolutely. Did anything else kind of surprise you from the research you were doing for this paper? How hard it was to find. I mean, I I also am one of those people. I don't shop at a grocery. 
I don't shop at a grocery store. This is what I do with Matt and others. So granted, I, I do buy from our local farmers for our meat. And I'm not as accustomed to trying to search for a specific type of meat. And a lot of them were actually pretty buried. Um, some out of eyesight. Like I would have to, I, specifically if I was looking for certain products, I would kind of go to the top shelf, which I would not, if I were not doing a mm -hmm. publication on looking at the prices, look there. So our local branded, uh, you know, meats are competing for real estate in a mainstream grocery store. And you don't know exactly where those are going to be placed. And then it becomes a chicken and the egg on if they're being placed in non attractive areas because they're not selling or moving as fast or vice versa. It's just a lot of things that are less in your control the more you leave a direct market situation. Matt, any thoughts that you've had? Well, I was just going to say that what surprised me is when we did this, we did the uh, price observations in New York and then also in North Carolina. Uh, up here in New York, I'm, I'm in Ithaca, which is relatively small town, but it's a university town with Cornell University in it. Um, here we found that the on average the prices at farmers markets were lower than the prices in the grocery store so that's very surprising because the the consumer um in fact we surveyed 200 consumers the consumer perceives that local farm prices are higher than grocery store prices for meat but when you actually do your observations on average the farm prices were lower so i had you know, that, that was surprising and I had kind of two reactions. One was to start telling the consumer, no, the farm prices are lower. And then on the other hand, telling the farms, you better correct this. <laughs> we need to raise your prices because, you know, we, we can't get packaged meat uh, done as efficiently as the system that supplies the grocery stores, right? So this seems like a, the need for a price correction, but that was surprising. Down in North Carolina, it was um, our research was done mostly in the Triangle area, and we found that overall the prices uh, from farms were you know, equal to or greater than the grocery store. So I don't know if that's the effect of uh, being so such a big urban area. You know, I don't know what we'd find in rural North Carolina, and, and we hope to look to, into that in the future. That's very interesting that they would think that it would be more expensive on farm. What if you had to leave kind of with a closing thought about when you're pricing as a farmer, um, what are some of the mistakes besides not raising your prices enough that, um, or what is the main mistake you would advise them to avoid? Yeah. Ooh, um, that's a good question. I think in a roundabout way, I'd answer it. Um, I kind of wanted to bring up an example. So I think a lot of producers, um, who might doubt themselves in the pricing and marketing uh, arena when it comes to meat and direct to consumer um, will be familiar with with um, auctions. So, you know, like a feeder sale, a feeder calf sale. So if you think about the example of, of a feeder sale or an auction, you can think about the bidders um, are the target consumer, right? And the product, instead of being a package of meat, it's it's a calf. Right. So you'll see just through the through the bidding activity that um, bidders will will bid higher for products that really suit them well. So the ideal calf product is a uh, steer, not, not a bull. Right. It's been castrated. It's a steer. It's got a black hide in this market. It's got a black hide. Um, it's been vaccinated. It's been weaned, not weaned on the truck ride to the auction. But, but, you know, actually weaned and started on feed. So, you know, we, we studied this for six years uh, up here in New York, and we found out the traits that the bidders paid more money for. And, and I kind of just listed those off. So take that example that you've experienced, what, what the bidders will pay more for, and now apply it to your product. Your target consumer, mm -hmm. when they recognize the value of your product, uh, they will they'll have a higher willingness to pay. That's why, mm -hmm. you know, again, black hided, vaccinated, weaned steers receive the highest price at the auction. So if you start to doubt your own um, your own marketing or your pricing, just think about that example. And you, you've seen it play out in real life. And so, you know, have the confidence to proceed uh, to do your market research and to set your prices. Mm -hmm. So I guess the biggest mistake is to sort of doubt yourself and sort of chicken out.
<laughs> That's a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Good point. Good reminder. So what you're doing is important. So heritage breeds are important. I think Christine had a few more comments. Let's see. Christine says in Europe there are many more types of cuts for sure, giving chefs more options for cooking. So yeah, that's a different market. <laughs> that's a good point. It is a great point. And you know, I think we can kind of credit the industry for helping us all out by developing some of these. I still think of them as new cuts, but like the ranch steak and uh, some of those cuts that are coming out of the chuck that you can cook on the grill, you know, that's really adding value to the carcass for, for all of us. And we should move our customers into those cuts too. Absolutely. And she says, put up quizzes or polls on relevant social media sites. So I guess you can, um, talk to your customers through social media and get some of their feedback. That's a great way to, if you're on social media, Facebook, you can put those up and get some good feedback. That's a good point. Yeah, and if you can, Matt, I think you might've mentioned this at one point, one of your talks and I always loved it. Uh, but, you know, even if you're going to be at a place like a farmer's market for a sh short amount of time, you know, use that time to accumulate those direct contacts, those direct emails. If you're developing an e-news, the more direct pulse you can have with your audience so that when they respond, you can follow up. Christine, your suggestions are great. And you can then, you know, you can then survey them through your e-news. Um, all the better. So bring them with you if, um, if you're leaving a farmer's market use that farmer's market as part of your marketing strategy for a few years and consider the time, you know, work that into your business plan and see if it's worthwhile if you hit a certain amount of emails and a certain amount of customer base that maybe transitions them to your farm where you have less marketing time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Matt, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think that was a nice capstone there. That's perfect. Yes, always have people sign up for your emails, take them on your journey. Get them excited about whatever it is that you're selling. Uh, that's perfect. Great advice. And then Christine also asks, are there any selling points that you can share for organic free range eggs? It's kind of all, all the all the same, you know, pull marketing, understanding that, you know, understanding your consumer, including um, where to find and reach that consumer. And and that that understanding also um, indicates how you should describe your product, you know, which, what are they, uh, what are they really seeking? They, they might say, um, well, I think certified organics, a, a great example, you know, they might say organic because it's a word, but you know, you can kind of try to find out what they want to know. Maybe they want to hear about the farm or, um, just use, you know, use your understanding of your consumer for clear communication and that will help you sell your, your products. I'm just thinking sometimes I see on a, a farm's label or, or on their brochure or their Facebook page, they'll they'll use that what that limited space they have to communicate and they'll say USDA inspected. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, that might have been a place where you could put some some words that would really resonate with your consumer. I don't know if your consumer is really mm -hmm. thinking about the difference between USDA inspected or custom exempt. So, you know. Think about what they do care about, and that's what you want to communicate back mm -hmm. to them. I've seen some of our uh, micro grant recipients um, talk about, you know, these are the chickens, they'll show little pictures, and they'll be like, this is the breed, and this is why we're saving them, and and this is why it's important for our farm to do this. And, you know, sometimes people get really into that. They're like, oh, this egg came from this chicken, and this color egg came from this chicken, and people... People love to go on that store. They're not out on the farm. They don't know these things. And so anytime you can be a little kitschy, they kind of, they kind of eat that. <laughs> Absolutely. And also with eggs, it's tricky because, you know, a lot of the time they live in coolers. So mm -hmm. I had to meet and just putting a cooler on a table at a farmer's market is boring and will mm -hmm. not attract mm -hmm. most people or even thinking about how that customer might shop at your stand. I mean, if you're at a farmer's mm -hmm. market, right? Mm -hmm. You're creating a stand, a stall, a storefront. So mm -hmm. where are they going to put their purse? 
where are they going to, do you want them to actually handle these things? Do you want them to mm-hmm. open the case and look in, or do you just want to give them the story of the visuals? So just mm-hmm. think through that process. Um, if it's for meat or eggs, it's helpful. Mm-hmm. I know one of our farmers here in the uh, Triangle area, North Carolina, has they went and purchased a bunch of small coolers. I mean, they're like, they're I mean, they're they're little mm-hmm. tiny travel coolers. We're used to these large coolers of meat that you have to shuffle through, and they put their stand in a little U-shaped um, kind of walk, and then each cooler has a different um, sausage pork, duck, and it's all nicely organized so that the customer can go through and they keep, and then they restock it in the back from their larger cooler. Mm -hmm. And it just makes it cleaner, easier to find. And they want their customers to go through it as part Mm -hmm. of the process. Um, So, you know, Mm -hmm. um, something to think about. It's another challenge, Mm -hmm. but also an opportunity with eggs, Mm -hmm. making it visual. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point that people are visual shoppers and uh, any way we can make it easier for them, it's always better. And so one of the main takeaways from both you, Sarah, and you, Matt, um, that we've heard is is mostly like think like your consumer and what they're looking for, which I think um, is a great point that we could all examine more in different markets. Um, and what you just said was exactly a question that we have gotten a few times from our farmers, which is how can we make our displays attractive if we sell meat? And that's mostly stored in coolers. And so um, either, you know, that's a thought for a lot of our farmers out there to think like the consumer, but I'm not sure if you guys have any direct um, thoughts on that, but it is something that's come up a few times. Yeah, I've seen some, you know, Good approaches. I I think it's it's a really challenging situation because most markets are in warm weather. Um, so you know I've seen people put uh, really good, attractive, easy to read lists, uh, pictures. Mm-hmm. Uh, a few a few around here. Uh, one actually bought one farm actually bought um, the sushi refrigerator case mm-hmm. and they would bring it mm-hmm. to farmers market mm-hmm. and set that sushi case up and just put cuts of meat in it because yeah again you see a nice looking fresh piece of meat, it might trigger an impulse buy, right? Um, uh, another one just has a, a, an acrylic container filled with ice and puts a few cuts out. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's a challenge. I, I always like to tell this story. Um, I help uh, I help run some holiday markets up here and uh, in, in November and December. And one particular year, it was really cold out and i felt like our meat vendors had their moment because they could just put all the frozen meat out on display they did <laughs> the vegetable producers had to lay blankets over <laughs> their produce and hide it all in the blankets so it wouldn't get damaged because it was really i don't remember it was well below freezing for the outdoor farmers market and i just thought boy this was our moment wasn't it <laughs> well and, you know it's funny you mentioned that when i i used to be at markets and we sell at markets and um, one of the marketing research things I read now it's dated now, but I imagine it's still true is that the more that the customer actually holds or touches a product, the more likely they are to buy it. Right. And so when we were having a product of the day, even though there's no reduction in price, there's no discount, there's nothing special about it, except that it's the product. Mm-hmm. Of the day. Mm-hmm. So basically mm-hmm. you know, making it all the easier for people to have some sort of relationship with that product. Granted, now we're, you know, we're in COVID, maybe you don't want to touch every single thing. It might be different. But I do remember that was one of the things for one of the farms I used to work for was mm-hmm. you know, get them to hold that product for a minute. And they're mm-hmm. much more likely. They're not gonna, you know, to feel connected to it. That's a great point. Yeah. It's a little challenging to be like, here, hold this piece of meat real quick. <laughs> Well, but I do think of that with that other vendor at the market where they actually mm-hmm. are going through it themselves and they are taking mm-hmm. it, especially mm-hmm. for people now that get a little um, shy about waiting in line to ask someone. They don't quite know the cut mm-hmm. to ask and they don't quite know the price and they might just not have that conversation with the farmer. It's it's a nice medium for those folks to be able to just lift a cooler that says mm-hmm. duck and get their thing and stand in line. Absolutely. Yeah, Sarah, I hadn't heard that before, but I... I'm really interested to hear what you just said. And I was at our Sunday market yesterday and um, two farms in particular that I work for, I noticed that when the customer came up and asked about, you know, your chorizo, 
they instantly get one out of the cooler and hand a package to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So you want, I'm answering your question, but I'm handing you this. So you're, now you're going to look at the color and the size and the, you know, um, very good. That's all smart. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to wind things down. Um, I think that's all of our questions. Uh, if anybody has last minute ones, go ahead and get them in. But uh, we've arrived at our shameless plug section of the day. <laughs> Is there anything that you y'all would like to uh, plug there, Matt? And that can be Meet Sweets again. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Matt, I think we already. I was say, I was say, you go first. Well, yeah. So we want to we want to plug Meat Sweet. Uh, if you're in North Carolina or New York, um, you can create a free account for your farm and list your products. And then um, the meat price calculator, which is available to anyone, if you, if you are in New York or um, North Carolina, you can create an account that saves your data, so that you can come back and adjust prices later. But if you're outside those states, you can still use the tool for free. It just won't uh, remember your data. Mm -hmm. And then we want to plug the pricing pep talk. We'll have one coming out for North Carolina, which will show up at ncchoices.com. Um, and it will also, I just realized, it will also go on to the meat price calculator website. We have mm -hmm. the New York version of the pep talk on there now. If you visit um, the Cornell meat price calculator website and you look at the tab that says get prepared, you can um, download a free copy of the New York version of the pricing pep talk, but soon we'll have our North Carolina one as well. All right. And yes, that's ncchoices.com and then meat suite is M-E-A-T-S-U-I-T-E, -E, like hotel suite. So if you're listening in. <laughs> Sarah, is there anything else you'd like to plug or invite people to join? No, I think Matt did it and um, Thank you all for the opportunity to join. Yes, thanks the for work having us. Y'all are doing, yeah. Well, thank, thank you. We're excited to work with y'all and to talk about pricing today. We get a lot of questions about pricing. You know, what's a good way to price, and, and how can I get people to pay more? So, thank you all for, for promoting the calculator and helping people figure that out. Uh, we really appreciate all the hard work that y'all are putting into it. Uh -huh. Um, big thank you to Manipro today for sponsoring Marketing Monday. We appreciate you. Big thank you to all of our um, members and supporters. Thank you for you know, making programs like Marketing Monday and Species Fats and all of our educational opportunities available. And we appreciate you. If you're not a member and you want to become a member of the Livestock Conservancy, you can go to our website at livestockconservancy.org. We would love to... Uh, have you join our community of huge breeders and stewards and people that just love animals. Um, we appreciate all of you. Um, plug fact as well, even though Sam couldn't be here today, she'll be here with us next month. Um, that's foodanimalconcernstrust.org. We appreciate all the work that they're doing and appreciate um, them partnering with Marketing One Day this year. So thank you to fact. And we'll go ahead and plug Sam's farm as well, even though she's not here. Um, she's at bullcityfarm.com. Um, if you're thinking about getting your kid into camp, she's running camps right now. You do have to sign up ahead of time. Um, but she would love to um, have more kids at camp. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Matt and Sarah. We appreciate you so much. And thank you to Emily Rose for joining me today on her very first day. <laughs> we'll throw her right into the fire. <laughs> And I'm going to go ahead and play our Mina Pro ad. Um, we really appreciate them supporting us for Marketing Monday. And there we go. Have a great week, everyone. We'll be back next month to celebrate horses. We hope you'll join us then. Bye. Champions, colleagues, roommates, and personal trainers. Whatever role they play, they're an important part of our lives. In their quiet way, and they're not so quiet way. <laughs> they keep us young, on our feet, on the go. They pull us back to nature and push us toward the next adventure. <laughs> and as much as we count on them, they count on us all the more. To nurture their lives with the same commitment. To protecting them, helping them grow and thrive. Treating them as well as they treat us. <laughs> by giving them a little more of our lives. Because no matter what role they play, 
out here or in here. We're here to make their lives the best they can be. Manapro, Manapro. Nurturing, Nurturing Life. life.